Well, welcome everybody, and thanks for coming to today's um, today's webinar. Uh, we're uh, kind of moving a little bit further afield uh, from some of our core topics. We're talking today about planning for sustainability and evaluating risks and opportunity. We have two folks uh, who are going to uh, work with us today. One, Victor Milligan, is founder and partner at Canbridge Advisors, which is a consultancy that helps businesses model and minimize risk presented by sustainability. The second is somebody you've heard from a couple of times before, particularly in the last year, Gary Jones, who is a founder and partner at River Rock, Advisor, River Rock Advisors. They're a value chain consultancy that leverages insights and analytics for business decisions. And of course, you know him from the work that he did to help define what forecasting might look like uh, in, in book industry terms over the last year, year and a half. Um, I'm not going to take any more time, Victor. If you want to pull up your slides, and, and I'll turn it over to you and to Gary to kick us off. Sure. Hey, thanks Thank a you. lot, Brian. Um, you guys have heard me talk quite a bit in, over the last year, so I promise I won't talk a lot. We have, at River Rock Advisors, have recently partnered with Carn Bridge Advisors to bring a more holistic view to our view and our world of the supply chain. And so thought it would be great to have Victor talk about how they see uh, sustainability and give you some thoughts on how you plan some of your tactics moving forward. So I promise I won't talk. What we really see is that sustainability is continuing to, I'm on the still, oh, the perfect, thanks. Um, from a supply chain perspective, you hear us talk a lot about trying to balance service, cost, and capital. Seemingly conflicting objectives as I try to provide impeccable service to my clients or my customers, uh, try to do so at the lowest cost by investing the least amount of capital uh, required by the business. So again, our overall objective is to have the right product in the right place at the right time. However, as there are the continuing emergence of both internal and external pressures to uh, be more sustainable in our business, this is something that we're, we're, we can't avoid. We can't hide from it. It's something we have to address proactively. And so we've added that to our service cost capital model, recognizing that it is yet another uh, dimension of a business that we need to try to balance, understand the trade-offs, the risks, the rewards, uh, and that way we can actually put together a holistic uh, strategy and approach for our business. Um, kind of how important sustainability is to you and your business really is a function of, it's unique to each company, but it's a function of where you sit in the value chain. Uh, if you are uh, in a customer facing position, then sustainability provides you opportunities to differentiate yourselves, your products, your services, and target different markets. So there's an opportunity to capitalize uh, on your sustainability capabilities uh, to the marketplace. If you're at the other end of the value chain, it's much more about compliance. So while you want to be sustainable, uh, you want to provide those benefits to your customers, uh, you're faced with a lot of challenges of just dealing with the compliance, regulatory, mandatory requirements associated uh, with your business. Everything so you to... one of the things we want to talk about is that there's not one size that fits all. And what Victor is going to do is walk you through some frameworks to think about your business, what's important to you, and how you actually put together a plan of attack. So with that, I won't talk anymore as promised. I'll hand it over to Victor Milligan, again, uh, 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 one of the founders and partners at Carnbridge Advisors. So Victor, I'll stop talking. Uh, thank you, Gary, and welcome to everyone. Um, I walked through some slides to talk about where we are with sustainability an approach that we built that we think helps companies make the right investment decisions. A little bit to Gary's point, proportionalize their investment to how they see risk and how they may see opportunity. So with that, why don't I start with just where we are with sustainability itself? And there's a set of regulations that are coming into place or are in place now from different jurisdictions. Although they're different, maybe in nature, they're often formed from the same standards and they're roughly pointing in the same direction. So from the EU, CSRD actually comes into place this Wait. month and it will affect over time about 4,000 US firms. In California, their climate rule comes into place later in 2026. It will affect 5,200 firms and importantly, it will pick up the, the private firms. 
It's still unclear whether the SEC will move or not. Their, their prior plan or the current plan was to come into effect in 2025, affecting roughly 10,000 companies in the US. And those are primarily the reporting regulations. In the EU, the deforestation directive is in place later this year. It's affecting many firms across the globe, those doing business with the EU. And then lastly, the extended producer responsibility, which really cues up the circular economies is already active in the EU and six US states in, in, in place now. Underpinning these regulations is a key concept of double materiality. It has been in place before that there's been single materiality, meaning what's the climate's impact to your business? That's been the staple of reporting for a while across the globe. What is different now is double materiality, which is what is your business's impact to the climate, which is a different kind of obligation. And in, in looking at that, there are four areas that are worth uh, sort of looking at individually, and they're listed here. So scope one, emissions. Those are emissions from your operations. Scope two, which are emissions from the energy powering your operations. Scope three, which is really the heart of this presentation, is the emissions across the value chain. And lastly, some companies do engage in carbon credits or carbon offsets that are available through different carbon markets, both compliance cap and trade, and probably more so the voluntary carbon markets. Those markets have been under a bit of duress of late and some concerns of integrity, but I think everyone's expectations is that they'll mature and become a key part of the puzzle. Another, another key part that's entering into the marketplace is shadow carbon pricing. And what this does is it puts a carbon uh, a price on uh, carbon and financializes carbon. Key to this presentation, it simplifies the ability for downstream customers to translate sustainability or carbon footprint into commercial terms. So this accelerates the idea that, that sustainability un, unto itself is a thing. The larger thing to look at is the business risk, risk that falls from it. From a compositional standpoint, scope one represents only 10% of overall emissions. This is in the US, by the way. Scope two is 18%. Scope three carries a vast majority of emissions at 72%. And this is why when you look to the right, this is why so many companies are being affected. There's just a long tail of these regulations. Less than 10% of firms will be directly affected by regulations. 90 plus percent of firms will be indirectly affected, those that are residing within supply chains. And they're not affected by regulations per se, they're affected by the commercial pressure that falls from scope three. And this is why this is relevant across all industries and all companies, small, mid-size, and large. And if you look at where you are in terms of progress, only 25% of firms um, are, are believed to be making material progress against sustainability. 75% are essentially at the starting, starting gate. Um, so really we're at the proverbial starting line in terms of sustainability. But it's important not to look at sustainability strictly from a regulatory context. There's other, there's two other parts that are playing themselves out. The first is the consumer, and the second is changing business practices. So just going through some of the some of the, the realities in place right now, 64% of global consumers and 53% of American consumers are very or extremely concerned about environmental sustainability. It is entering into the consciousness of the consumer. Today, 11%, I'm sorry, US consumers are willing to pay 11% more for sustainable products. So there's been much discussion about a green premium. A little bit is a bit aggressive, but some form of premium already exists. And typically there's a lag of about 15, 18 months between sentiment and actually purchasing behavior. So I would expect that 11% to increase over time. So why is that happening? A key reason is 42% of US consumers are affected by severe weather last year. And of them, 79% believe climate change was the key cause. So we're a little past the, is it real, is it not real? It has entered in to be a, a sort of an understood part of the fabric of how we live our lives today. To give a sense of the economic toll away from the human toll, the cost of severe weather in the US is $1 billion every three weeks. Contrast, that was $1 billion every four months in the 1980s. So the magnitude and frequency of severe weather is increasing notably. But it's not just the consumer, it's also business practices. 
research from the EU shows there's a 20, point, 20 basis point difference in lending rates to those with good sustainability ratings and those with poor in the rating agencies are actively engaging this market. So the cost of money differences are already coming into place relative to sustainability. So going back to you know, where we are in the marketplace, 75% of firms are essentially either in the unaware or aware state. Unaware meaning they're not really sure what it is yet and not really sure how it affects their business or aware they're they are aware of both, but they haven't really taken action. A little back to Gary's point he made earlier, a key message from this presentation is there's no one size fits all approach. This is not about moral obligation and this is not about going big. This is about finding the right destination for your company based upon your assessment of risks and opportunities. And we think there's four different destinations that are worth talking about. The first one is compliant, that is meeting minimal commercial requirements, and you're pretty reactive to commercials. You're just sort of doing what is required you just to keep pace with the market. Webinar on the, the other one is productive where you actively start changing up the materials in your product. And so the Green, um, Green Book Alliance uh, estimates that 49.4% of a book's ca carbon footprint is composed of the material themselves. So we'll see companies change out the materials of their products. We'll also see companies more aggressively engage in recycling and circular economies. This goes beyond minimum requirements. It just goes out to sort of change how they operate their business. Some companies will see sustainability as an opportunity. They may innovate with new products and new technologies to create new revenue streams. Some will actually make sustainability the basis of their business, and certainly that will be true in climate tech and clean tech. That'll be the DNA of their business, and they'll be able to shape and make the market as they go. But a key message here is that to come out of the at-risk category, but your destination depends on your assessment of risk and opportunities. So it's probably worth noting, how does one look at risk? So today's risk environment is quite fluid um, as the regulations come into place and as the downstream customers begin to stand up their sustainability operations. Today's risks are in fact modest, but that is changing. Emergent regulations we just talked about are coming into effect. Importantly, they bring two pieces apart just from reporting. They bring third-party third party audit, auditing which moves from self-reporting and also comparability, which leads me to the, the second point, which is you already have benchmarks. So World Benchmark Alliance is an example of where firms are actually uh, publicly comparing um, the firm's claims, their targets and progress. So this will be increasingly part of reputation going forward. We walk through the growing consumer concern Again, I expect about a little, little lag between sentiment and purchasing decisions, but we should expect the consumers to play a more active role in applying pressure relative to sustainability. And lastly, the downstream companies are already beginning. Many of you already received questionnaires. They're already standing up their operations and there's a keen eye towards scope three. So from our perspective, what we think is companies should model risk now sort of decouple planning from action. So at least understand where you are and what risk you expect to face in the next two years. And as you can see on the right, we looked at a set of category risks. This is a relatively general view of risk at this point in time. But the key theme is that from a standpoint of likelihood and impact, all risk from financial risk, customer risk, reputation risk, stakeholder, operation, competitive, et cetera, all risks escalate rel relative to um, impact and likelihood. The one risk that may, may actually be become less over time is the risk of the carbon markets because they, they'll likely go from a very low integrity state to a higher integrity state. So the offsets claimed are likely to be more um, viable and believable over time. As you think about risk and you think about disruption, it's probably worth noting that pretty much all disruptive forces mobile and digital revolution, COVID, supply chain disruption, deglobalization, et cetera, all of them cause a performance dip to companies. And the question in front of companies is really how deep and how long. The dip will come primarily affecting margin, but again, there's different approaches to make that dip as short and shallow as possible. So looking at two different scenarios that we've seen play out against other disruptive dynamics. In scenario one, Companies that anticipate and accept the reality in hand, even if it's alien, 
but they proactively and but proportionally allocate resources to, to address the new reality. For them, classically, the dip is shallower and shorter. And importantly, after the disruptive period is over, they tend to benefit from the upside and sort of ex exit that, that uh, disruptive period in a better state than others. Alternatively, companies that either do not anticipate, understand, or simply reject the reality, their core goal is to maintain operations at all cost. For them, classically, the dip is deeper and longer and sort of worse is that they, they tend to have to overinvest later against a compressed time frame to catch up to lost market share or wallet share. So as we think about this presentation and there's if one, one visual takeaway, this would be it, is to keep your dip as short and shallow as is feasible to come out the other side in better shape. Another outcome of risk modeling is to get a really clear sense of what the market expects from you. Because a little bit to Gary's point, it's not a one size fit all set of expectations levied against each company. So the key is to understand what is the business imperative and then how do you how do you measure up against that business imperative? What we believe is that you should look at it from five categories, financial, operational, governance, market, and sustainability, and further break that down. And the reason we think you should break it down further is because it gives you a much more surgical view of the investments and actions needed. So in this example, what we saw with this company was that if you sort of look, look at it clockwise, is that they were unable to anticipate risk. And so from a governance standpoint, they were, they were not ready to take on the disruption that was in front of them. They had not placed it into budget or financial plans or any allocations. There was no sense of what initiatives from a portfolio st uh, uh, standpoint were needed to get going. They had no plans and no capabilities to measure or report up into uh, to, to the downstream customers. And importantly, at the executive level, the, they had very different belief systems about the firm's responsibilities, obligations, how sustainability fits. So they were un, you know, unable to get going. This is probably not unstandard. This is probably a pretty classical view of where many companies are. And also gives you a good sense of these are the first steps forward to take in terms of initiatives. We can go through the what in terms of what steps make sense, but it's also worth talking about the how. So a, a key concept for us is that sustainability should not be treated as other. It should not be treated as an appendage toward the torso. It should be treated to the best of the collective ability and in, in integrated into core operations. To do that, we think you should stand up cross-functional sustainability working groups representing key business functions and business lines to get everyone on the same page because ultimately they're gonna to have to take on sustainability at some point in time. Mm -hmm. With a responsibility to drive a bit of the change necessary for this to take place, durable alignment across the business lines. The working group should report back up to the executive team and CEO, and in some cases, the board. From a, from a financial standpoint, sustainability is likely a two, three year endeavor at least. So budget should contemplate at least a two, three year run at the base level just to keep the working group functioning. And that we think there should be a portfolio management structure where you can fund initiatives as you go based upon the merits of the initiative and expectation for the cost and complexity of that initiative, as well as the payback expected. But again, this should be integrated into existing operations. And so use your, your existing financial and governance processes to the best of your ability so sustainability is not treated as other. It's not an appendage to the torso. It is part of core operations over time. So I, I wanted to be, you know, use our time wisely. So a little, a little bit of time for presentation and probably more so for conversation. But we, Gary and I did want to leave you with three takeaways. One, sustainability is unavoidable. It's coming to a thin area of you regardless of where you sit in the marketplace. This is not about a moral obligation. This is not about going big. This is finding out what's the best outcome for yourself based upon a, a applicable a, a ability to model risk, minimize risk, or in some cases, manage, uh, uh, seek opportunities. Lastly, is that managing the dip is managing inevitable impact operations to keep your dip short and shallow. Here, the key concept is time. Get started now. Decouple planning from action so you 
in the very near term, have a clear sense of what risks are coming at you so you can plan accordingly. I hope this presentation was helpful in just sort of sculpting out how to take on sustainability into your operations. Um, and Gary and I, thank you for your time, thank you for making time available, and we'll, we'd love to field your questions. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Um, I was uh, kind of uh, live streaming questions as they occurred to me um, as, you were, uh, as you were talking here. Um, let me encourage everyone to uh, uh, post their questions in the chat. Uh, but in order to kick off the conversation, we can uh, certainly start with um, some of the ones that I've got in here. So the first one is, there are a lot of dimensions of sustainability, including greenhouse gases, pollution, carbon footprint, you know, on and on and on. Um, how does all this come together? Is really the focus on carbon footprint or are there other, um, how do you pull all this together? Yeah, the two outcomes are, um, that the companies report on is to be carbon neutral, which is really a comment strictly on the carbon footprint, and then net zero, which is a comment on all greenhouse gases. Most companies have some, some combination of both targets. Carbon is perceived to be easier to get at because it's, it's one, one piece of the puzzle. Others like refrigerants and fluorocarbons, others, they, they will fall into the greenhouse gases, and but both will be part of the puzzle. In our work, we have not looked distinctly at use of water, pollution, biodiversity, others, because we think that the scope three pressures, which primarily focus on the greenhouse gases, are such an acute uh, in, uh, issue in the market. And, and that is actually a really great segue to my next question is um, the biggest challenge, clearly the biggest piece is the scope three emissions. And getting all of our suppliers to be able to supply that information to us is difficult. And if David Hetherington is on, he's going to talk about getting hit with different kinds of uh, surveys and things like that as a supplier. Yeah. Uh, what do you see as a way to help suppliers get a grip on that scope three uh, work? Yeah, so it, I'll look at it from two angles, it coming to them and then them going to their own supply chains. But so the first is the response to questionnaires is that what we've seen is the question, the answers to the questionnaires are not readily available. And probably at first blush, there's probably not a lot of belief that the data is good. So there needs to be time given, and this sort of goes again to the planning and action thing, to begin recognizing you're gonna to have to report it out the data is likely dispersed across your organization. It probably hasn't really been looked at from a governance standpoint in a while. So data quality may be, data quality and data completeness may be a real issue. So start that process now across all your business functions, looking at the questionnaires. And there's a couple of um, sort of pro forma templates that are out there that may help queue up if you haven't already received a questionnaire or survey. I, I certainly, sorry, if I can speak as a, as a former vendor, um, I'm not sure if David's on. I, I did get uh, an accessibility questionnaire from one of the very largest publishers, um, and we were completely unable to answer 95% uh, of the questions. Yep. We, had no, we had no policies in, in process. Uh, we didn't even know what half the questions meant. Um, we had absolutely no clue, uh, and the answers were almost all, we have no idea. Now, we yep. were small and a lot of it didn't apply to us and we don't really produce anything except software. So a lot of the questions were genuinely none, but a complete inability to answer did not go down well with the uh, with the, the publisher. And um, I, it was just shocking. It was a very long questionnaire. It took a long time to work through. Um, I had to put it up to our CFO who had absolutely no clue what to do with any of it. And, and um, in terms of potential impact on the company, our biggest customer could be could be problematic if you really can't answer those. And it was it was a very instructive in terms of the sorts of things. And, and part of that was actual metrics that were required. You know, what are your metrics? Are you achieving your goals? What are you, what are your goals? <laughs> yeah. None of those we had any answer to at all, um, and it was coming. It's coming very quickly. I su I suggest. Um, yeah. So the, the questionnaire thing is a good place to start if you can get hold of one. 
it was done by a third party. Um, so you know, there are companies out there that are sending these out. And, and in terms of, Brian, you asked about partners. I think it's really important to probably to bring partners in um, from printers to, to other, other partners because a lot of the questions were, um, you know, we're not just interested in you, we're interested in every company you work with and have you checked that they have appropriate policies, particularly if they're offshore. Um, very, very difficult to answer that without including your partners in the conversation, I think. That's my, my Thank you. version into the conversation. Uh, nice. Um, it occurs to me that as the reporting becomes increasingly important, that it probably ought to get centralized into the finance organization. Um, but I imagine that's, that's difficult to, to pull off in the very beginning. What we've seen to date is that the general counsel or that function is the one mostly taking the lead. Uh, and they have the unenviable role of doing what Nicholas, you just talked about, which is looking around everyone sort of saying, not me. Um, uh, we work with uh, a prior GC who specializes in ESG, uh, Christine Yuri, just because we saw the GC place a formidable role. But a little bit to your point, Ken, we think it should go strictly to finance because shadow carbon pricing will make this ultimately a financial question as well. Um, in publishing, we like talking about things for, it seems like forever before taking any particular action. And this field is, or in this, this issue, sustainability is particularly rich with rabbit holes. Yep. Um, is there a way to like cut through it when people are like bewildered by the fog of regulations and technologies and alternatives? Yeah, there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of hype in the marketplace. And I, it's a little bit to your point in the rabbit holes. There's a lot of things that said that really aren't ultimately going to be a business risk to you. And so what, you know, what we've done is gone back to that risk model because it gives you one view of different ways of looking at how risk is coming at you. And so you can kind of look at it in one form as to what, what your company is really facing. There's another part of how we work that I didn't talk to, which is scenario planning, which you can take the same model and then look at what would be the implications, a little bit to your point, Nicholas, if, if a key customer decided to take an action that we didn't anticipate or we weren't prepared for, what happens if a competitor decides to move because they think there's opportunities for wallet share and you know how do we combat those two things and those things those two together i think kind of can help separate the wheat from the chafe to figure out what are the big issues that you have to get at first but one one likely piece is that it would be good to segment your customers i know gary you do a lot of work in this regard getting so that you're pr most prepared for your major customers because they will be coming at you. And obviously you don't want to lose share there. Um, we've certainly seen that um, in the K-12 market. We haven't seen it around sustainability yet, but I'm expecting it any day, but we have seen it around uh, DE&I and yeah. uh, minor minority and women owned business enterprise uh, regulations. Um, and I'm just expecting it at any point somebody's going to come through and say, you need so much either recycled paper or, you know, FSC. Oh, yes. Yeah. Speaking of which, uh, do you have a particular, um, is it resolved yet whether uh, recycled paper is better for the environment than um, um, FSC virgin fiber? Is that, has that been resolved one way or another? Just because of all the energy that's required in recycling? Is that a question to me? That's the question to anybody. Yeah. So it might still be an open issue. Yeah, I think there, I, you know, there's a, any number of discussions around recycling paper. One being is it, the traceability of it, the nature of it, and the expected uh, as people stand up, they're recycling. Or we expect to see prices to go up in that market, which may make other options attractive. Interesting. Um, I've, I've, this this might be uh, sound a little combative, and I apologize ahead of time. Um, but I've heard uh, uh, carbon credits 
talked of as a really good way to avoid taking responsibility for your own actions. Yeah. Do you, do you have a, an opinion on that? Yep. <laughs> so the voluntary carbon markets, which really are primary source of these credits, they've been a mess. Um, there was a study done last year, I think 90% of the uh, acclaimed credits were phantom. Um, I, I'm not sure where Delta stands the litigation right now. Um, and a lot of the assertions of, of net zero were based upon those same credits, Ken. And I think there's been real concerns about the integrity of those markets. And you know, we talk about the maturation of them, but I expect to see that over, over a measure of years, not months. It will be for companies in high emission environments, it will be central to their strategy. But I think, I think the thought process has moved from credits as a primary source of sort of getting to neutral, if you will, and move towards more transitional planning where credits can take a larger share of your, your progress to net zero early because they're early to you buy them. Um, but ultimately, there needs to be a discernible, a, 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 a clear effort to reduce your emissions because that, that the credits won't survive it. Um, and there's, I know, Alex, you're on the phone. I'm not, I know there's been a lot of work in the EU to, to get it so that each market could be assessed based upon integrity. There's a number of different bodies, like there's a VCMI, Voluntary Credit Market Integrity Commission or, or group that does a lot of work there. So I'm not sure if there's any re recent movement there. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think it's, it's a really interesting question. And, I, and in a way that the, the, the question about the kind of the, the integrity of the carbon markets is really, really important. But I think another question you asked, Ken, was about, you know, you said my CFO isn't willing to pay 11% more for sustainable products, wink. The, uh, the, we were talking to a, um, a company right at the start of a supply chain today. And effectively, they're a, they're a low carbon producer because all of their production is based on recycled material. And most of their power comes from, comes from hydro. And so as they try and uh, uh, commercialize that, their low, their, their low carbon position, the way in which they do it is they take, well, look, the nominal price of carbon in the EU cap and trade market is 70 euros. And in the voluntary market, it's 15 euros. The average, the average um, carbon emissions for their, the product, the market that they're in worldwide is four tons of carbon for every ton of product. And their carbon emissions are next to zero. It's just transport. And they can't claim a premium for the four tons, but they claim a premium for one ton. And they, they use the price of carbon in the EU cap and trade market to assert their right to do that from their customers. So it's like the, the integrity of the, of the voluntary market is going to be critical to help companies that can't abate, that are on the path to abate, is going to take them ages to do it. It's critical for that, but also the capacity to financialize carbon as uh, Victor mentioned in the presentation, I think is also really helpful in uh, powering a conversation about how to how to how to bring this into in how to bring this into uh, people's businesses. Uh, you know that's that's a I think a really great point. I had not thought of the ability of monetizing your own carbon efforts via the markets. But that's kind of like the Black Scholes model applied to uh, sustainability, I guess. Pretty yep. interesting. Um, and uh, think about um, um, being ready for this. Um, I, it, it reminds me of where we were with accessibility for websites, um, say four four years ago, five years ago, when publishers were like, "Well, this is all very nice, but it's going to be very expensive, and we don't really need to do this." And it, you know, nice to have. Um, and then suddenly states in the US turn around through their public library system and say, we're not buying anything from you unless your website can be proven to meet these set of standards. And, and since then it went berserk very quickly and the standards have got to get more and more severe. Uh, well, severe is an unfair word, I suppose, but, but more and more rigorous every year. 
Um, and um, as a platform provider, it's very, very expensive to, to actually get um, your website cleared to be accessible. There's a, so much involved in that and it's cost everyone a great deal of money that they weren't expecting. Um, and as I say, it went very, very quickly from nice to have to must have if we're to keep doing business with major states. Uh, and now I see there are a couple of lawsuits where where websites, have, you know, big, big damages are being awarded for not making your sites successful. So I see this this to your point, really following the same line where, you know, suddenly uh, sustainability is going to be going to move from getting a relatively friendly uh, inquiry from a, uh, a customer to you got to do this or you're going to be in, in big trouble. So I think think answers need to be found um, and, and to be prepared for this to be pretty quick. And, and if I can just, yeah, because I can just add there, I mean, I suppose the, the, our experience of the way in which compliance has been or regulation has come into effect in markets that we've worked in is that, you know, there's a period of communication which is going on now and then big fines are leveled at big companies, and that makes everybody yes. that makes everybody pay attention. And that's exactly the process that you're describing there with um, with 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 website accessibility. I think, and so we wouldn't be surprised to see that over the course of the next year, year and a half in uh, in sustainability. Yeah, and one of the things we saw that concerned us early was that there's there's an obvious caution to take on big investments without a lot of knowledge of what it all means, and so people held. And what they also deferred was the planning. And so that means that they're now sort of self-inflicting a very compressed time frame upon themselves. And you know, our biggest argument is to separate the two out from each other so that if you can see risk more clearly and you can defend the investment because it's gone from a nice to have to a must have, as you say, they at least allows you to more gracefully place this into a budget versus you working now in a, essentially a tiger team in a react, highly reactive mode. I, th I think having a process in place is, is really important. I mean, uh, even if you don't know what you're gonna do, at least have some sort of regulatory process within your own company. I mean, one of the questions we had was who, who on your board of directors, not your management, mm -hmm. board of directors, is the responsible person for sustainability? Well, good luck with that one. Yeah. Um, but you, know, you, you can at least quickly and, and or cheaply at least be ready to start working out how you would report metrics who the responsible people are yep. as you say put you know put a line in the budget for it at, at least show show willing um yep. even if you don't have any results and that can be done quickly yep so if the industry were to go entirely ebook and digital would sustainability be resolved no that was a trick question <laughs> explain your answer show, show your yeah, work <laughs> i mean there's been a there's been a, a fairly significant body of work about the carbon footprint of of the digital environment of the internet um and it's not zero and it's hard to calculate because there's so much sharing and so many sort of it depends answers inside it but nothing's free um interestingly we've been doing work a little bit with uh consultancy that works in the in that world and they themselves have also been getting a bunch of questionnaires from the amazons and from the googles and microsofts of the world and that goes down into now their server farms their data centers how they fuel those things all you know now they're having to get a, a fuller view of how actually they bring products to market and the digital they sorry the carbon footprint of the digital footprint if you will that's not it's not free and I, and I still think that when you get into recycled paper and I've seen, I mean, I, in preparation for this is to see if I can get a clear, you know, a paper book is this and a digital book is that. And I still think that work is still being done. Andreas um, makes, yeah, go ahead, Andreas, yeah. your point. Okay, I, I, I'm Klaus, but that, never mind. Um, oh, um, sorry. Um, sorry, uh, just a sec. Uh, uh, go ahead. Andreas made a, a, a really good point also from your company about printed books are a carbon storage mechanism as well. And I thought that's what you were going to comment on. You're on mute. 
I'll leave it to Andreas. Very good. Uh, Andreas, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> yes, um, I would just um, say that when you have the numbers, we know that uh, books, physical books, can be a carbon storage, uh, but uh, uh, it's not counted in that way simply because we can't close the life cycle an analysis. Uh, we can't show where the book ends up even though most of us know that it's on the shelf somewhere. Uh, so there are starting to be made some estimations with uh, the book being on a shelf for 25 years or when it goes into recycling again and so on. But it is difficult to, um, to, to uh, determine because we don't know where the consumer uh, uh, or what the consumer does with the book in the end. So that's actually why those numbers not uh, accounted for uh, with carbon sequestration. So, um, yeah. So would it be better to throw your book into a landfill than to burn it? <laughs> <laughs> I'll um, have a guys answer that. <laughs> well, uh, actually, uh, as I stated, uh, you can actually produce uh, physical books with quite a low emission uh, on it. So, um, we can create a book that emits around 300 grams of CO2, but uh, we can show that uh, almost 800 grams of CO2 is stored in that book. So it would be carbon negative, but uh, we can't just <laughs> use that numbers. But technically we could produce them like that uh, on end and throw them directly in recycling bins and keep the life cycle analysis closed like that. Uh, but uh, we have uh, an advantage in a small country like Denmark. Uh, life cycle analysis is uh, uh, a bit better or a bit easier to to uh, to uh, get all the numbers where um, um, where the products end up and recycling and so on. So we're a bit lucky like that. But we actually have some numbers on it. Does the uh, go ahead. Yeah, but did, did, there was a question. Uh, well, if if we went to ebooks, would that solve the um the 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 problem? But but it wouldn't. Um, sort of our analysis shows that um reading ebooks on an iPad or reading uh, printed books um it equals at fifty read books a year. And I maybe some of you read fifty books a year. But that, that's not the average. So you can read 50 printed books in a life cycle analysis compared to what it costs on a life cycle analysis reading the books on your iPad. So 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 it wouldn't really solve the problem. It adds other problems instead. So another um, uh, person asked if, uh, Victor, if, if you are aware of any specific information about how the consumer views sustainability as a priority in the book market. I have not seen anything that is as clear as sort of how they feel about sustainability broadly. Um, there's been, I think Andres, you mentioned a couple studies in your presentation in December about different, I think you did, different consumer studies that are now ongoing about how consumers view different baskets of products, one being more environmentally friendly than the other. And I, I still think that's work just getting started because I think Back to the presentation, I would expect consumers to start shifting sentiment to behavior in the next 15, 18 months. So. Um, I'd like to actually shift back to something that Andreas um, made me think about. So when, we, when you cut down a tree and then use it to create paper to go into a book, you're essentially taking away the sequestration that it would have until you could regrow that tree, pretty much. Does that go into the carbon footprint calculation usually or, or not? Uh, no, it, it, it doesn't go into the calculation. Uh, that's a, a bit of a shame, but when in certain carbon calculators, the numbers feature, uh, but it won't be uh, withdrawn from the final emission numbers. Uh, but it is uh, something in the uh, publishing and printing industry we should be very aware of to com communicate that we are actually in that industry. Uh, and uh, when you use FSC or certified uh, uh, forest or paper, um, then uh, you help uh, biodiversity. You do a lot of very good uh, things. Uh, so you can actually um, uh, 
um, do more with uh, if you switch to FSC paper, you actually uh, cross off a lot of boxes. Uh, so it it uh, it depends on where you are on your sustainability journey and what the low hanging fruits are. But uh, it's something you should use as a communication tool to your consumers that you actually, um, um, when using FSC paper, you actually help uh, planting two trees for everyone that's cut down, et cetera. So uh, it's an important thing uh, just for your storytelling to your consumers also, um, if you're in the printed book market, at least. Um, I, I'd like to, uh, to mention that the presentation that uh, 2K Denmark did in one of our sustainability groups, I thought was just a fabulous deck um, and really outlined a lot of really great, uh, great information that I hadn't seen before. So yeah, it was if great. there's a way to, to share that, that would be uh, pretty useful. Um, Victor, are there any case studies? So speaking of convincing CFOs, um, are there any case studies of either negative or positive results from either so negative of not pursuing what you're saying or positive from pursuing like look this company and this company did this and they had maybe a little dip and it worked this company and this company didn't and they ended up with big problems have you seen anything like that i, I see them forming i'll just i'll reference two that are more long term and and probably more at the extreme so neste and i think alex if you could expand upon this would be great, great. neste decided neste, yes. i think it was something like 10, 11 years ago to change out their product mix in anticipation of this. And I think they're yeah. now bearing yeah. the fruits yeah. of that in terms of hyper growth in their business. Alternatively, those that from a CFO perspective that pursued offsets as the principal part of their strategy and those offsets those to your offsets question to collapsed. Your um, I think what they're facing now is both that the numbers got rebuilt in terms of their real path to net zero and then two is they're bearing the cost of litigation risk and all the other issues that come along for the ride, all the oh, reputational issues and others. Another good one. So, um, I, I, you know, the, the product mix is a funny one because it's going to take time. So you have to think of this in terms of, you know, two, three, five year planning horizons. And I think what we have found is companies really struggle because they're so conditioned to quarter annual planning cycles that the idea that you're going to think that far in advance or invest for something that's attained later that far, you know, that far in the future, I think is still a, a change in thinking at the executive level. Well, your, your, your mention about making it a risk management consideration, I think helps to address that. Um, yep. I know that anybody that's been in a big company has spent a lot of time working on business continuity plans and risk management yeah. plans and things like this. And if it goes into that um, kind of channel, then you're going to spend time on it and you have to analyze how much it's going to cost you. Yep. Yep. And we thought it made sense because also you, the board typically gets engaged at in the risk side of the house, at least the executive team is engaged. It's, it's part of the fabric of governance of the business already. So it fits easily into how the business works. So one next next step that one that people could take away, Nicholas, I'm going to come right back to you. But a, a next step that people can come away is when you get that survey from your general counsel or CFO on what risks do you see affecting the business in the future, this ought to be one of the ones that you mentioned. Yep. Yep. Nicholas, sorry. Um, I just wanted to throw, and I did put a link in earlier in the chat, um, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals um, are a really good starting point uh, to share with your company. Um, and I put the link in to the, what those goals are. Um, the UN also, so there are, I think, 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which they're trying to set up as, as sort of lodestones for sustainability. Um, you know, it's, some, it's written at a level that even board members can understand. I mean, it's, it's just a, a good run through of what sustainability is, what the goals are. Um, I assisted them to put together uh, a protocol so that all of the documents on the UN site, for example, uh, are tagged with which sustainable goals that particular article meets. They also have a global compact that you can sign up to and say, we as an organization will do our best to uh, to reach the help reach these sustainable development goals and sign up on it and that that in itself is and I use that 
um, to rewrite our mission statement to incorporate the Global Compact. All, all of these things are, are, again, not expensive to do, but they, they do show willing, um, at least. And it is a way of engaging the company that might look at you blankly and say, don't know what sustainability means other than not driving our car. Um, and understand what it is is, is going on. Um, so it's nothing to do with finance. It's just to do with what the goals are, what sustainability is. And I, I did put the link in. I think I, I found it really valuable in terms of explaining to my company what this was for. And how are they at remembering all 17? Uh, they're not, other than, nor do I, <laughs> other than go back to that, uh, to the chart. As the, refer as the <laughs> reference. To remind yeah. yourself. Yeah. Um, so um, there, there's a lot there, uh, but but to be honest, um, if you were a publisher, you would look at that and say, well, these ten are nothing to do with me. I don't do anything to do with that. So it it it's 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 a little bit easier than it seems because you you can I think anyone could look at those seventeen boxes and say, yeah, those five do apply to what I do at work, and yes, we could do something about it. Yeah, um, I think that I think that deconstruction process is critical because if you take them all on, it's just an awesome task. Yes, it's, it's too it's too it's intimidating, and I think what you want to do a little bit to your point is pick the ones that are truly applicable to you and truly matter to your business ultimately, and just get started on the things that matter most. Because I think what what it might have done just because they came out, it intimidated companies thinking they had to take these grandiose, large, highly disruptive steps versus being more incremental in their planning and action. Um, David, I know that you had said that you had a question if you're still on. Um, I didn't uh, know exactly what that was, but here's your opportunity to ask it. So uh, was, Victor, do you have any direct experience with either the BookChain project or Echovatus in terms of reporting mechanisms? I don't. Because those are two organizations that we are asked to report to. And I think it is um, the, uh, the information, at least in the case of BookChain, that they require is, uh, I guess, the only word I can use to... Uh, uh, describe it as character building yeah. in terms of the amount <laughs> of information you're expected to report on. I think, it, it, David, David, uh, we have we have we have some experience with Echo Vardis to the degree that one of the companies that um, we are talking with uses Echo Vardis as a way of assuring its counterparts in the market that it that its emissions are what it says they are and i guess that's that's kind of critical for them in their in their business because the the question of carbon and carbon emissions has really moved and become a a kind of a a, a, a kind of a, a lever in competition and i think that their their comment about echo vardis was that it it would kind of it was seen as they they saw it as a, an essential tool in competing in a mark in a market where sustainability was developing developing in 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 significance, albeit you know that's in in in, in Europe. Could you, you spell have that question? Of, sorry, uh, uh, Echo I'm, is, I'm sorry. Oh, ECO Vadis. Okay, I was looking up Echo Goddess and I couldn't find anything. All right. Oh, well, that's another website, Ken, but not for this discussion. Uh, <laughs> I do have another question, if I may, um, and that is: uh, Do uh, what? Are you, what, are, Victor? What are your thoughts about whether or not uh, internet our international competition in the book manufacturing market are going to be held to the same standards that uh, U.S. book manufacturers are going to uh, to be required to uh, report to? Yeah. Alex, can you touch on that? Because I think there's some rules coming out of the EU that actually worry about it in the opposite way um, um, in terms of the EU putting rules in place that may make their their market less competitive unless they put some some financials in place. Um, the tariff structure. Carbon. Yes. Yeah, so uh, in in 
in Europe, the, the the approach has been very much based on um, regulation and uh, the imposition of the imposition of tariffs. So for industrial or in, for exports into Europe, there's a there's a there's a an adjustment mechanism at the board at, at the border where the carbon that's embodied in products has to be paid for at the rate at which carbon is 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 charged in the EU's cap and trade scheme. And I think it's a very it's a very kind of different system than the one in the US where there's been much more focus on the incentivization of lower carbon uh production through government tax breaks through uh, grants and so on and so forth but the, the the in the eu there's a real there's a real kind of sense of we think this is you know it's really, this all all this is important the regulation is coming towards us we're dealing with it now and um, consumers are more concerned about it but the regulation is uh is 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 stifling and makes it really difficult to get to get to, to, to get business done but i but think to your me, question let me Dave, sort of I... phrase the question uh, uh, do you believe that um competition that u.s manufacturers are facing for particularly from asia that those organizations are going to be held to the same standards that we are here in the united states in exporting into the eu yeah, and exporting into the united states so we both manufacture books those books come into the united uh, and those books are ultimately being sold in the united states so my question is uh, a company produces 5000 6 by 9 uh, one color paperbacks in china and or they produce those 5000 one color paperbacks in the united states is the expectation that our that our compliance with sustainability issues in the united states will be better than the Asian manufacturers are, and that in effect the Asian organizations will get a pass. I I, th I think the intent of the regulations and an intent and intent of the standards underpin is to make those comparable, so that regardless of where it is produced, that there's a full accounting of the carbon footprint, including the production process, transportation, logistics, the whole bit, and that at some point in time the the entity at the retail side can do that comparison. And I think that's the I know Andres, you might might know a little bit more about this. This is part of the certification certification processes and other processes that will be used to create a, a bit more equivalency and comparability. Uh, yeah, um, just uh, shortly on it, uh, we know it's very very difficult to uh, uh, to compare. Uh, like it's set in the uh, bisque apples to apples because it's produced different places and we don't know what numbers they have, but we know that everybody is really uh, working on it. We also know that in Asia, they're really working on uh, becoming more sustainable and uh, we are trying to uh, uh, get some numbers to, uh, to, to uh, compare uh, different production sites, um, but uh, we know that the regulation is being made so that um, uh, everybody would, uh, in uh, a short time frame at least, it could be a couple of years, uh, everybody would be subjected to the same sort of regulations, uh, uh, US, Europe, China, uh, Africa, everywhere. Uh, so that's really the regulation's goals. I don't know if that uh, answered the question. Yeah. I think there's intent to be fairness in competition and, and the carbon not carry a little bit back to Alex's point and sort of an unfair market advantage for those that are treating it differently. Well, it's very, think... excuse me, it's very common to believe that producing in Asia would mean um, a more uh, a polluting uh, effort, but I don't think it is really. It's changing a lot. Uh, Printing on bamboo paper instead of wood paper, uh, printing with uh, colors made of uh, soybeans instead of uh, artificial chemical colors. Um, uh, we got to look up because they're going to produce stuff that uh, sort of are much 
more forward thinking. Also, you the use of solar panels and and and, and green electricity is growing there. So, so, well, it it will be a competition point so to see whether your U.S. or European graphic industry can keep up with the efforts made in Asia. And Victor, I think one of the consensus uh, recommendations that you've made today is to move it into the financial area. And at that point, you're creating comparability across different vendors, different sourcing, different uh, distribution scenarios. Right. And, yeah. and so there's a common denominator. Uh, we need not predict whether Asia will be better or worse um, in the future, but rather to say that it needs to be evaluated in a common framework. Right. And I, I think the, the critical point of the um, shadow carbon pricing, it allows a full financialization of that work so that you can look at things to the best of your ability to uh, the apples and apples comparison. Yeah, we're just, we're creeping a little bit past time. So I, I wanted to, to just touch on one thing that was in the chat. Uh, there's an interest as well as sharing the um, earlier 2K presentation that we did in sustainability working group. Uh, would it be possible to share the slides that you use today? Oh, I'll be happy to. Absolutely. Thanks. I know Gary normally wants, he'd use no presentation as final, but perhaps you can rest it away from them and see what happens. <laughs> That's what I'll happens when you're involved in continuous improvement. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get, and and Andreas, you don't need to, to do the legwork on that. We'll send it out to everyone who's registered for this call. Um, the uh, the other thing I was going to say, I put in some, some notes about a, um, publisher printer checklist, which we, the Green Book Alliance developed and released last year. We're currently working on a, a printer distributor slash retailer checklist. We're actually going to have a conversation about it next Tuesday at 11 o'clock Eastern. So if you're interested in that, uh, write to us, uh, probably best to, to me, Brian at BISG.org. And we'll, um, we'll get you added to that conversation. It's essentially, we're just starting to develop it. But if you look at the the printer publisher checklist, you'll have a pretty good sense of the framework. Uh, Victor, uh, Gary, thank you very much for putting the notes together. I think you've seen some of the uh, um, the, the comments just as people have been uh, winding up in the chat that they've found a lot of value in today's conversation. I certainly have. Good. And we look forward to having you back in the not too distant future, both here and, and in our other working groups. I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you for everyone for your time. Take care, everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you.